So I'm going to move this table here. I'll be talking about learning space, and if you ever bring me to, me, to your school, you'll find that I start moving things often. So, uh, I was very excited for Priyadeep to uh, invite me to this conference. I thought it would be interesting uh, to see what's happening in India. I was, uh, I was here in Bangalore uh, 15 years ago, and I, was, uh, I spent a summer here. And uh, one of my most memorable days of my life was in this city. And uh, a particular day was uh, started with, I was at a, a workshop for rural women who, um, there was a charity established where they would, they would raise some money for women so that could have their own cow and they would then use this milk for sale and become financially independent. So this was a wonderful um, uh, NGO that my friend had established and uh, during that day they brought the women in that were part of this program to um, his studio. And so he said, you know, the milkmaids are coming. And to me, this word sounds, you know, very like out of a fairy tale that we'd have the milkmaids. And the milkmaids came, and I talked about uh, some, uh, some programs that happened in the U.S. a long time ago when I was younger uh, about uh, empowering of women and uh, choice. And after I gave my little workshop, we were going to... Um, culminate the visit by going to uh, the milk factory. And at the, so we, we got ready for the milk factory. It was a very exciting for these women to see where their milk was going to go. And we got ready, and we, we put flowers in our hair, and we, there's all this excitement. And then we got on the bus together, and we rode through the streets of Bangalore, and the traffic probably wasn't as bad as it is today. And we got to the milk factory, and uh, we saw, let's see if this clicks. We saw this. We were, we entered, and the women were filled with awe and joy to see the gleaming tanks and the tubes and the glass. And as we entered into the milk factory, a few of the women asked if they could hold my hand. And, and I said, okay. And then other women decided that they wanted to, to be in, embraced as well as we walked down through the factory together. And I had maybe 15 women on each arm, each arm uh, as we were going through the milk factory. And it was like a cathedral to them, a, a temple of wonder and excitement. And I, too, was wrapped up with the excitement and the joy and the emotion of what was happening. And we toured together and we looked with awe. And when the tour ended, they were going back to their village and the women cried with tears of missing us, missing this experience we had. And, and the reason I tell you this is this interconnectedness that we felt in our tour of the milk factory was something about what a great lesson feels like, what memorable learning is about. And we don't have the right terms to talk about the neuroscience and the right metaphors about what happens in this type of moment. And I'll follow up on some of the things that Mr. Bradar was talking about, but this interconnectedness is what happens even though we might not be touching each other in a room when you have a great lesson. Let's see here. What I'm talking about today in talking about learning space and neuroscience is something I call compassionate dot space. And what I mean by this is a few things. Compassion because I'm talking about a great lesson has this feeling of empathy, has this feeling of emotional connection between you and the others in the room, the other learners. The reason I use space, I'm using this in a geographical way. For those who, are, who uh, have their degree in geography, there's a difference between the word place and space. Place is like a point on a map, a location, a longitude and latitude. 
Space is a place of doing. And when we're talking about the space of schools, what is this place of doing? As Mr. Bodar had mentioned, this is a place of learning. So compassionate dot space for me is what I want to create in a school environment. What I've been doing for the last 27 years as an educator, trying to create this space of learning in which that is powerful and emotional and connected. I have three pieces to this. One is intention I'll talk about, second is pedagogy, and third, maybe the, the least of importance, the actual design of a room. When we Google classroom, this is what we see, 200,000 images of. It all looks like this. Even though we, we believe we're doing 21st century learning, it hasn't really changed that much in most places. This is a school, it was a custom-built school, an uh, international school, one of the top ones in the world um, in Sofia, Bulgaria. This school was designed to have an, to be an eco-school with a green roof and chickens and uh, the raising of crops and the re renewal of water. And I was so disappointed when I saw what the classrooms looked like because that was not forward thinking at all. Not much is changing, unfortunately. What I want learning to feel like is like in this picture, this is a picture of my son four or five years ago, and he's at a science exhibition, and he's making a bubble, a giant bubble, and you can see to the tips of his toes and the energy on his face and the excitement of this experience to make the big bubble, all right? When we have students in this kind of state, this is where memories, deep memories are laid. Hands-on experience, emotional experience. This is what truly works in education. One of the first pieces I have is intention. And I've come to these conclusions first by uh, speaking to some of my old students. So like I said, I've been teaching and, and being an, a leader in education now for 27 years. And some of my early teaching was in urban, low-income areas of California, some really terrible places that something's out of the movies, guns, drugs, helicopters, riots kind of schools. And in those environments, I created this wonderful world of a classroom where we loved each other, we cared for each other, and great learning had happened. And I wrote to some of my students who are now are adults, and some of them with children, and, and I asked them, I'm doing some speaking on learning space, can, can you tell me about some of the things that maybe you had liked that we had done or that I had in the classroom that, were, um, that, you, that you, you remember and you thought were great? And almost every student who wrote back to me was very mad at the question. They said, it wasn't about what was in the classroom, they said it was about you. And I said, me does not help. Um, I'm, I'm a school leader, I need to try to help others. And they said, no, it was, a, it was about what you did. So I had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what is it that makes one teacher connect to kids and maybe other teachers who are not connecting to children. And this is so easy to see as a school leader. I have to do inspections around the world with accreditation agencies. And I walk into schools around the world, and you can walk into a classroom and in three minutes know exactly how those kids are feeling. It's palpable. There's, a, there's an unconscious experience that all of us have when we know that students are engaged and learning and feeling good in that learning experience. And you can also go into classrooms and see when they're desperately hoping it will end soon. Sometimes I have pleading looks on the faces of children, like, please save me, get me out of here. So the first thing I had to understand was, what is it that the teacher needs to do? What is the intention that has to happen? And what is neuroscience saying about this? Neuroscience is saying that 
it's dependent on the teacher. It's dependent on the leader of the room to set the emotional conditions of the room. As an audience, you connect to a speaker. As a classroom, you connect to your teacher. How the teacher comes in and experiences what is happening is felt by everyone else. We don't have the metaphors to understand this. We say things like we're wired to each other or there's like a web between us. But this is really hard for us to understand because we can't see this connection that's happening. So remember when I was telling you about those women and we were walking through the milk factory. This is what it feels like when the connection is really happening between others. But it's the job of the teacher to set that. If a teacher comes in feeling very down and tired and exasperated, the students feel that. If you are energized and you are excited about the learning and you're a passionate teacher, inevitably it's contagious in a room. And we know now through MRI and other neuroscience studies how palpable that is, how powerful that is. So the first thing for those who are the teachers in the room, this is, this is on you, this is on us to set that stage and how we connect with other people. This connection we call neuroception and we have a, what's known as a polyvagal response. The back of our brain that is handling um, our understanding of safety is continuously being checked. Every quarter of a second, your brain is asking the question, am I safe, am I safe, am I safe? And if you're not feeling safe for whatever reason, your unconscious response is to be put in a flight or a fight mode in which you are unable to learn. This is what the faces of safety look like. The top part of your face relaxes. The eyes and, and the muscles around your eyes are in a relaxed state. These beautiful young girls are in a state of safety. You can see the comfort they have in each other, even the comfort they have with the photographer who was actually their PE teacher who took that picture. When you're in safety mode, then your great learning can happen. Then you can be creative. Then you can receive information. You can experience a lesson. This is a picture of danger. This is from one of the first days at school, at my previous school. We have some students in the room who are feeling safe, and we have some new students who are unsafe. Look at this boy here in the black jacket and his stiff positioning. And the look on his, on his eyes are of, um, of stress. The girl in the corner with the glasses, she's been at the school for years. She's laughing at the photographer taking the picture. This girl in the black jacket here, she's new. She's in a very, very tense state as well. It's the first day of school. They're worried and stressed about being at a new school, and they're trying to figure out how to interact with others. As teachers, we can see this in the faces of our students. And this is something that is often misinterpreted by teachers. This is what happens when your sympathetic nervous system is stressed. You get the same look on the face. Stressed, sad, content, happy, anxious, surprised. If you're in a state of danger, it all looks this way. Many teachers will interpret this as that the student is somehow angry or withdrawn and is not participating. They'll get mad at this student. But what the student is displaying is the danger state. And what we need to do is be, we need to be empathetic to them and try to find ways for them to reach a safety mode. This is my classroom from a couple years ago. We had an outdoor space and uh, when the weather was a little bit better, 
I was in Estonia then, and so the, the temperatures are, are very different than in Bangalore. So this is a beautiful fall day for us, even though we're in, in jackets and such. And in this environment, this was taken from above. We didn't know the picture was being taken. We had this very large open space where any of us could, could sit. We were working on some essays for uh, theory of knowledge, but all the students gathered around and we were all in this very nice tight-knit corner because we cared about each other. This is my second year with these particular students. And what you see here is this relaxed behavior. Students are working together, they're talking. I'm in a conference with a girl about her particular theories she's working on. This is what you want to, you want to begin to have happen in your classrooms where you're getting connected and sometimes is about physical distance. I often try to, in very important meetings with my board, and other places. I will do my best to try to find the smallest of tables to get us around together. The closer you are, the more chance you have of creating this empathetic state between others. Again, you'll see that it's a relaxed state. You touch each other, you're near each other. I'm in a country where you don't generally touch. In Finland, there's no hugging. There's, there's, there's always a distance between everyone. So it's something that I have to overcome in my school. But the children who come from around the world uh, break those rules all the time. The second piece that I've been learning from neuroscience and the implications is about the pedagogy and how that has to change as well. What we've learned from mirror neuron research from macaque monkeys is that the perceived leader of a room, whatever their actions are, your brain are, are following those same actions. If I lift my arm like this, and we had an MRI on you, you would have also, your brain is using the part of the brain that is lifting the arm. They found this research by, uh, a researcher was, uh, eating some bananas, and they had the machines on the monkeys, and the part of the brain that lights up when you eat a banana was lighting up as if the monkey was eating a banana too. And what this is telling us is that this connection between others is embodied, which means that whatever is happening, when you're enthralled by somebody, when you're inspired by another, when you hear a story that is something that you find that is interesting or passionate, you take it on in your body. And you take the learning on in, in many different ways in, in, uh, through the visual field. Here I am, it's a sports day, and we're doing some yoga together on the field. but. When we're imitating each other, this is how we're learning. The brain lights up in this imitation process. So when we're talking about hands-on activities, we need to physically show. And physically showing helps embody the learning in others. It's not sufficient to tell or have them to just read. Here I am with my son, and you can see the, the nature of the learning. Piaget, the famous child psychologist, talked about that we learn to imitate. Neuroscience says, uh-uh, it's the other way around. We imitate to learn. He's embodying in his own body when he watches me do something. This happens in science experiments. This happens in the analysis of poetry. This happens in any course that you're teaching. You need to model and scaffold so that they can see and hear and understand how it works. It happens in, in, in all of our, our lives, especially at a young life. We end up not using it when we get to the upper school levels of our, of our classrooms. Somehow we just say, read and learn it. And they memorize shortly for those tests we were talking about early. And then it is quickly forgotten. What we're learning from leading neuroscientists in education, Dr. 
in Mordino Yang is this. It is neurobiologically impossible to build memories, engage complex thoughts, or make meaningful decisions without emotion. We used to think that we had a rational brain that made decisions. I'm sorry to tell you. We have an emotional brain that we then, we then rationalize. Emotion comes first, and it comes physically through our body about how we perceive, how we perceive an event, how we perceive a learning experience. We physically feel it in our bodies. It goes through our emotional senses. It is then reconfirmed by our prefrontal cortex. If it if it fires, it wires. How does the, the neurons fire? They fire when you're emotionally remembering something. And all of you probably have an event in your life that was very scary. Maybe you were in a car accident or something terrible happened to you. And if I were to ask you to recall it, the amount of details that you'll remember from a past event that was emotionally charged is very high. You might have other events in your life. Maybe it's if you're, you know, a mom, the birth of your child or the holding of that baby or all these other types of emotionally high-level experiences. Why do we remember the detail? Because the emotion is layering the memory system. If you do not have emotion in the equation, it's quickly lost. The brain says, I don't have time for this. And all those guys and ladies who are involved in ed tech at the moment, unless you can figure out how the emotional piece gets fit into this, all of that learning is not going to stick. We have to find ways to make that a more memorable experience. Dr. Imordino Yang also says, we only, think of th we only think about things we care about. And for all the students in the room, they know this exactly. Right? They're not going to remember certain things they don't care about. Although there's some brilliant children in this room at the moment, very impressed by some of the answers that have been coming out. When we understand that communication is a transfer of emotion, then it puts a different type of pressure on us as educators. How do I create a lesson that is powerful and meaningful? I have to think of the emotional context first. One of the easiest ways to do that is with storytelling. We are wired to experience the stories of others. Evolutionary speaking, storytelling is one of the most powerful teaching methods that are, that are available to us. It's a way to start a lesson. Maybe it's not, not the finishing of the lesson, but how does the teacher get everyone on board tell a story that goes along with that lesson, why this is important, why this is interesting to you. And then the whole room wires with you. We feel, therefore, we learn. This changes, in my mind, how I have to train teachers. This changes what I need to do as a school leader. And when I'm looking for professional development for my teachers, I'm wondering about this. How can I give better training to this? And we're doing things like cognitive coaching. We're doing programs in which we're finding ways to really focus on the well-being of others. Learning has to be active. We must do something. So that pedagogy, once you get going with the kids, this is where that mirror neuron research is so important. And we're wondering, how do, how do teachers fit in with all this technology? We have, a, we have an incredible role that we do not want to cast aside to technology. We want technology to be a tool with us, but we need to be willing to understand that our emotion is key. Here's the teacher's job now. Have students simulate, imitate, and experience within a positive emotional experience. That changes how we've been thinking about learning. I was taught, and some of the leading I've done in the past is about teaching teachers how to make a very interesting lesson plan. And we ask teachers to be nice and kind to students. It's so much more. And this is the difference you see in a great classroom, a mediocre classroom, and a poorly led classroom. 
Are the students doing something? Do they feel something as well? And something good, hopefully. The last piece I wanted to talk about is the design. I've been working with Juhani Palasma, a leading architect in Finland who, who is also involved in this idea of embodied architecture. Not only is the emotional experience of a room felt by the people in the room, but how the room is conceived in an architectural sense influences your state and that safety state. I often say schools need to start thinking about looking like a boutique hotel in a way that it's soft, it's textured, it's comforting, there's lots of cozy little spaces. This is what we like as humans. Sarah Robinson has collected a, a, a number of um, leading architects on this topic in this mind in architecture. She says to accept that our minds can include aspects of our physical and cultural environments means that the kind of environments we create can alter our minds and our capacity for thought, emotion, and behavior. How we reconceive the classroom experience or the learning space is dependent on us understanding this. It's influencing that safety state. One of the things I talk about to other schools is thinking about how we add texture back into our classrooms. Many years ago, we started to create very clean and shiny and smooth surfaces, super easy for cleaning, but they don't feel good to the human body. I often said that in America, there were two types of schools. One, the expensive schools looked like hospitals, and the poor schools looked like prisons. And it's the same kind of sterile or not so sterile, detextured environment. When we understand that the environment is not like nuclear, not, not like Newtonian physics, but the physics of, um, of nuclear physics, we understand that there's this whole unconscious experience happening with our physical environment. Here I am with a group of students and we went to a local cafe. Again, this kind of experience feels good for a student. We're close together. Right, look at the space between us, it's very little. We have texture in the tablecloths. We have, we have old bricks in the background. We have different types of lighting. All of these can influence what is happening in a learning space. This is at my old school in Estonia. We put some couches and rugs in the hallways. And this was originally going to be for parents, but we said anybody can use it. And this was in the early days when we adopted iPads six, seven years ago. And what we found was that the students wanted to be in these spaces and we let them. Learning can be anywhere, why are we stopping them? Why aren't we making it comfortable? When we go home in the evening, many of us don't sit at a very, very um, formal desk anymore. We sit on the couch and we slouch and we enjoy ourselves with our devices. In the classroom environment, I like to look for things like round tables again, get close to each other. Let's smush, I would say, let's smush each other into the room. Then we're gonna be connected to each other. I like right now the room's getting more filled. We're gonna smush each other, smush more people in here. This is a, in my old school, this was a windowsill. We put, a, put some cushions on the windowsill and this girl, um, loved to do her reading and work in the window on the cushions. Why is this? We understand that children like to have enclosed spaces. If I had little kids in here and I said, you can read anywhere you want in the room, chances are they'd go underneath the tables, right? We like this closed space. Even as adults, we do too, but we're not always so cognizant of that. When we want to do design in our schools, in our classrooms, we want to try to find ways of making connection and empathy in that design. How do we get more, how do we get closer together? How do we add texture? How do we add a feeling of safety? 
This was me in my, my office a few years ago. Um, and to me, I use this as an example, is that they know that when the hierarchy has been lowered in your school, then the students feel comfortable with you. This is the surprise they gave me by putting all the balloons from the, the school dance into my classrooms. They knew I would think it's funny. What we want to do is lower the hierarchy between us and the students. We want to sit on the same couch together. We want to talk. We want to get to know each other. We want to help each other's learning. This is my new school in Helsinki, and we're in the middle of remodeling our classrooms. Here are some things we're adding. We've added this booth into our classrooms. It looks like some kind of cafe table. And you can see it's probably made for two students, but four are squished in there. Right? We have round tables, we have different types of chairs. We want to give kind of choice and selection into what's happening. We have a teacher, uh, we have some students up front. It feels like there's flow happening. They're all getting their work done. They're working on some projects at the time. Oops. Let me go back. This is a first grade classroom. We've made these wooden type cubes for the little kids where they want to go for those, remember those reading experiences under the table? We're trying to find these spaces. For students who are struggling in school, these are often a place for them to go and relax and calm down as well. They love these spaces. And actually, you don't see in the top here, but we have also pieces of fabric that they will then cover themselves with and they will to create doors and windows. They can use them as uh, places in which they have uh, plays and all sorts of creative things. Uh, it's, oh, I'm ending soon. This is in the hallways. We've made these what we call study stops in between the lockers. So again, a place for, for closeness, togetherness. I often just sit in one of these spots and people will come to me all throughout the day and sit next to me and, and talk to me and tell me about what's on their mind. We want to have learning everywhere. So this is, we just want it to spill out. That's how we see it. The school is just one big learning space. Find places that are cozy, add spots that are cozy, add little corners. We've added a a, a green wall here to add some oxygen to our lives. We've added different types of lighting. We, along with a school in Denmark, one of the first schools in the world to add biorhythm lighting that mimics the, the, the sun during the day. I live in a dark place. When I left Finland a couple of days ago, it was pitch black at 11 o'clock during the morning. Right? So lighting, lighting is very important to us in Finland. At the end of the day, you want to have this kind of experience, just a joyful, wonderful place where kids can learn. They feel safe, happy, accepted in a compassionate environment. And that's, that's my show. If you have more questions, you can always email me at negli at gmail.com. Thank you.